What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Phil LeBlanc of Fun Day. You can check them out at funday.agency. And Phil, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. You guys do beautiful storytelling. You have beautiful design. Um, one of the episodes I did was with the co-founder of Pixar. Um, and he talked about some of the original days, starting Pixar. He talked about... Um, George Lucas, Steve Jobs, incredible stories around that. And he was before his time. So he had to wait for the technology to catch up to even create Toy Story. So check that episode out. Also, because this is part of the top agency series, uh, I did an episode or two with Jason Swank. Jason built up his agency to over eight figures and sold it. Um, and now he's been, they've been buying up agencies and growing that way, which is interesting. And he has a group where he helps agency owners grow as well. Um, and we talked about valuation and the whole landscape there. Those were, that was great. Also Todd Tasky, Todd Tasky is a second bite podcast. He pairs private equity with agencies and, uh, finds that sometimes in the agency sell to private equity, uh, they make more on the second bite than they do on the first. So it's interesting. Again, the landscape of valuations and um, business development and growth and, and M&A. And we're going we're gonna to have some conversations probably around bootstrapping versus raising money uh, that ties into this because because Phil has a lot of um, knowledge on that. Uh, before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. And we do strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, Phil, we call ourselves the magic elves that run in the background that make it look easy for the host and the company to create great content and create great relationships. So for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Phil LeBlanc. He co-founded and serves as co-CEO of Fun Day Agency. And Fun Day Agency, wow, Phil, you've had amazing growth. They've grown to more than 60 employees. They have high profile clients. Uh, some I can't even mention, uh, Sarah Belly, Arla Foods, 7-Eleven, and many more. And before this, he actually ran Flixel Photos for over 10 years. Um, they raised $8 million in funding and achieved top download spot on the Mac App Store. And he's also innovated in advertising by pioneering the Cinemagraph. You'll have to tell people what that is. But Phil, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. You know, Fun Day Agency, which we'll talk about, um, it goes back to you told your story in a video from Flixel and talk about what happened with that. Well, so, um, I, I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling. Uh, I think it's the, you know, there's, I think Steve Jobs said that the most powerful person in the room is, is the storyteller. Uh, he always, uh, talked about it's funny you mentioned Pixar earlier on because that book is full about you know it's everything around storytelling and and I love their book and um he Steve Jobs himself was talking about you know Disney almost had the monopoly on storytelling and and he didn't like that he wanted to kind of take that back and you know I I mention it because another book that I read which was quite interesting was the you know the power of story and it was all around whoever tells the best story wins and it always stuck with me that as humans you know we share experiences through story and it's really important to connect on an emotional level don't just tell a story that has facts but bring the highs the lows the the you know make them feel make your audience feel and you know, that's why we love watching movies, right? That's why we, uh, that's how our society kind of uh, in a big way imparts knowledge and and how we kind of uh, do things as a society. 
And in the world of advertising, we do a lot of that, right? That's that's the power of storytelling. We just do it in kind of micro micro uh, content and 30 second ads and, and all the rest. So I say that because I want to bring the audience to understand that, that was kind of the mindset. And when we were running Flixel uh, around year six, because I did this for 10 years, um, we were running out of money, uh, which was a constant, you know, in the startup world. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, product businesses, we just, you know, just need to look at the the world of um, Fortune 5, you know, the, the stock market right now. Tons of companies aren't profitable. It's really hard to be profitable when you are a product business. And so you need you need to raise capital. And I always tell other founders, like when you are raising to VCs, they're, at the end of the day, they will still buy emotionally and then rationalize what they bought, just like we all do in everything else we buy. It's no different. Now, you have to still have the metrics and all the rest. And so what we did, and if you go in the company section of where, where you're going um, and you scroll down, you will see that story that we're talking about uh, continue scrolling down it's the flixel startup story uh, so we said yeah so if you're listening there is a video and we're looking at flixel.com and the company page and we're looking at the video and there's tyra banks and so the idea was we have this amazing product that does cinema graphs it's very visual let's do a story around the making of our company so that investors sees all the challenges we went through over the years and how we're trying to build a new visual storytelling medium. And so we knew we had a lot of great B-rolls over the years. And then, so what we did is for a week, we sat down, we wrote the, you know, the storyline, we filmed it, edited it, and then we put it out. Uh, it's like a five minute type of, you know, type five minute video. and. The results were incredible. In a few weeks, we actually raised over a million dollars. One investor in particular, we never even talked to them directly. They just watched the video and they wrote us a half a million dollar check. Uh, they were in Australia. And so just to show the power of storytelling, because everything was conveyed in it, the resiliency, the mission of the, 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 the company, where we're going, uh, what we faced in the past, uh, the opportunity, but we did it in an emotional way. We didn't just, you know, use facts and stats and all the rest. We conveyed the story. And then, of course, you send a deck with, which has more of the facts. But this is something I tell startup founders as, as a mentor uh, of Techstars and Founder Institute is always lean into your story because most founders they have an incredible story of why they're doing their their business and they don't tell it they don't communicate it and that's a lost opportunity and so one thing we love you know at, at fun day is working with uh ceos and because they get to tell their story to us and we get to convey this into their products and infuse that of course we don't always take their you know origin story so to speak but we get to understand the personality the dna of the founders and what are they are trying to ultimately uh, accomplish with their their products or services and you know the, it, it is a superpower that folks need to lean in more in uh it's it's something that you, you need to develop i believe i'm a big believer in it it's not something that you're necessarily born with um but we're all kind of storytellers so to speak and we need to um, we need to tell our specific story. So um, probably lingered on a little bit too long on no, that. I, but that, I that love was the that. Kind of a, so yeah. where does Tyra Banks fit into the picture with this? Well, you'll have to watch the video. But uh, <laughs> the the idea, you know, the the story, the, the what what happened, just kind of in a nutshell, is um, we started uh, the software called. Um, uh, well, the company's Flixel and it's called Cinemagraph Pro. And 
we actually there's another video behind that story too now that you bring it up so what happened is we launched a few weeks after our competitor we were behind it was a hot you know it was a it was a race and we were behind we we're running out of money this was early on but we did a video as one of the launching pads we did a few different videos so this the storytelling kind of runs throughout the history and Tyra Banks had seen the video and she loved it. And she saw that this was an opportunity to use cinemagraphs for her show, America's Next Top Model. And so she saw the video. We were running out of money. We were close to shutting down. She calls us and she effectively says, you know, I want to integrate this with our show. I want to be an investor. And then we managed to get a bunch of other mm -hmm. investors along with that. And it was throughout uh, the cycle 20 of America's Next Top Model, it's all cinemagraph shoots. So using our technology. Uh, so that really kind of brought us into a, a, another level, as you can imagine. And uh, that led to more partnerships and more opportunity, meaning Panasonic and other, other you know, the, the, really the photography uh, landscape and then brands. And then actually that launched Flixel Studios which was us doing production work using the cinemagraph as a lead-in for campaigns. Um, and so that was kind of the, the birth of two parts of our business, which was one, doing production work, cinemagraph campaigns, and then the other selling the software for um, everyone to be accessible to, to, uh, to use. What's um, some of the, again, there's, there's a lot of ups and downs in a yes. startup. Right. And you mentioned being on the brink of you know, collapses, maybe too too much, but like running out of money. Um, and then you get this customer who then also is an investor as well. What were some of the challenges and tough times that you now bring to Fun Day with your experience? Yeah, I mean, I talked about resiliency. Um, it's something that I think has been talked about a lot. Uh, in, in the world of business. It's absolutely critical to have resiliency and you have to have belief in what you're doing and why you're doing it. It goes back to your story. It goes back to why are you, you know, what's making you want to bring this to into the world? Um, because in the hard times, and you will always have hard times, not all the time, but you will have hard times. It, it doesn't matter how successful you are in any business. If you know your reason of why you started this, it's a lot easier if you still believe in it to be resilient. And so you need that resiliency. Um, uh, in addition to that, I think you need to surround yourself with the right people. I think that is also critical because it's a lot less lonely when you have the right people around you. It's still going to be lonely uh, as a founder. Um, but when you do have co-founders and that share your vision, and uh, that's super important. I, I, um, I've i never started a company alone, uh, always with co-founders. I'm always amazed to the founders that can do it solo because it's uh, it's a lonely journey. And I think it's it's easier to be resilient and to to you know, pull yourself together. Now, that being said, it's also easy to get into infighting as well. So you also have to, hence, you got to pick your your co-founders, right? And you need to make sure you're aligned and, and people do change too. So that's another kind of variable in the mix. So um, there's a lot to unpack, I guess, on-, on How did you on meet your co-founders? Because I know you work with them at Flixel and then I think you work with on Fun Day as well. Yeah, so there's so You must one... have liked them enough. <laughs> Phil to to continue. Yeah, so there's one co-founder. So this is uh, really the third venture uh, with this co-founder. So we had a, a startup called Our Balance, uh, which was a health and wellness that was done, you know, long time ago. And then that was like corporate wellness. And then a second startup, uh, Flixel, and then the third one, Fun Day. And uh, he's the only co-founder out of all the three that's been consistent. So we've been, you know, over 15 years doing companies together, um, or almost 20 years now. And um, at this, this time around, we decided to be 
co-CEO because we're so aligned now in terms of, you know, we have different strengths and weaknesses. And, um, and we were very fortunate for Fun Day to find really the other two key co-founders that um, has made our success of Fun Day go so rapid and um, and really aligned. And and so one of the co-founders, well, both of them actually, we had worked in some capacity before we ventured into this one. So there was, you know, without going into too many details. Um, so I, I do think like if you what can were work you looking together, for? work together before you yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. What were you looking for? And you said, you know, obviously. Yes. Yeah, so, because so of, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I think it's important to have different skill sets, different personalities, um, but a shared, shared vision for what you're trying to accomplish, a, sh- a mutual respect. Very, very important. Um, Communication is going to be ongoing. One of the things that, you know, learning from uh, from other startups that is part of my journey is, you know, we hired a, a, a coach from day one, a uh, kind of a startup coach that was part of our inception. And um, we meet every week with that, uh, with that coach and uh, it allowed us to, you know, it issues that could fester or take longer we address it uh, much quicker so Mm. it doesn't become you know something where it becomes really difficult to repair later on you'll still have your challenges you're still going to have your disagreements and all the rest that's that's healthy and it's actually how i think you get to a better end result but what you do want is the respect while you're in that disagreement so you're all trying to find the best solution not trying to win your argument but trying to find the best path forward for the end goal which is for the business to grow and to prosper that's really interesting phil so from the beginning you have a weekly we won't call it therapy session but it is you know there's probably some therapy in there too (laughs) um, certainly is of business and just just navigating uh, the personalities um and are there three co-founders or four we we're, we're four partners. We're four, four okay. partners got at Funday, yeah. Because I know yeah. Mark was the previous one at Flip yes. Soul. Okay, got it. Yeah. So it's four of you. How do you decide to choose a coach? Like, how do you find a coach? Uh, in this case, there's someone we Mark and I had worked with prior. So mm-hmm. we we brought to the fold. Um, and so the other two obviously trusted us. And uh, obviously, if the coach wasn't right, we would have you know not continued on uh, over the years with 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 him but um yeah i mean that is uh one thing that you uh have to gel and he's a professional at this and right. you know he's got a business uh that they they do quite well you can check them out uh, blueprint management um um cool. Shay is his name and um yeah blueprint management and then do you find i'm sure you've these sessions have iterated over the years, but what what's the format like when you walk in? It depends on the week. So there's hot topics. There's um, what's going on in the week that is, you know, start with, by celebrating the wins. Well, in our case, we start by celebrating what's fun because a fun day and we can talk a little bit more around the, the name because uh, there's a lot there around culture. Um, so we, we touch on different, you know, different things that's going on the business, uh, some things that are working in the business, some things, you know, uh, like working on or working in, uh, sometimes it's specific issues related, um, on, you know, something tactical other times it's more strategic. So it, it, it varies. And because it's weekly you kind of see what was covered the last time and sometimes you kind of bring that back and there's continuity so um it's still fairly free-flowing i would say just in general um but there's there's a bit of structure within that free flow yeah i want to talk about culture for a second before we launch into that talk about the transition from flixel to then the idea of starting Funday. 
Yeah. So, you know, one, one of the things for tech startups is, you know, you, it's a very competitive market and you have a window and you either sell your company or you have to keep iterating and innovating and before money runs out effectively, or, or if you're profitable, normally you, you know, have a lot of different paths, but the reality is most tech companies are not profitable. And I mean, we see it in the public markets, the vast majority of tech companies are not profitable. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite competitive and you have to get the scale. And so we had, um, well, I mean, Flixel is still going on, but we had a software solution, which we've created called Cinemagraph Pro, which for those listening, it's basically, it's still utilizing the advertising world. It's essentially a, a medium, a new medium, ideal for um, micro content. Now it's used primarily for billboards, so digital billboards. It's um, essentially a hybrid between a photo and video. So everything is still, it's a photo, you've probably seen them, and then you could have just a hair in motion while everything else is still. So the movie industry uses it quite a bit. You'll see uh, some of those. And there was a period before 5G, before TikTok, you know, people were familiar enough and confident enough to do video. This was kind of the perfect ad type for mobile devices and Facebook pushed it a lot because it was low bandwidth mm. because of the way the, the cinema graph crunches the file, because there's only a little bit of motion. Uh, it had motion, which is attracts your, your eyes and it's more catching than, than photos. You can direct the audience to your kind of brand, whatever you're trying to sell. Right. So if you're selling shampoo, then the hair is in motion. Then if you're selling something else, it could be, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to, trying to sell. Are these some examples here? No, these are, this is fun day. So this would be yeah. on, on Flixel. So, um, well, I mean like the, the images are moving or is this a video? No, no, it would be where everything is still and just a part that's in motion. So, Got it. um, if you go in, in Flixel, you'll see examples on the, Got uh, it. cool. And so very popular for a period of time. Uh, we had a window, we came close of selling it. Uh, it, we didn't, uh, now it's, primarily use uh for big you know digital billboards and it's more of a niche versus you know all of the smbs uh that could use it for their digital ad strategy on facebook um which was the market we were going after because we were competing against adobe photoshop that you could do it there but much more complex so we were going for the you know the prosumer market and the the small business owners and so um when that became clear that it wasn't going to get the results that we had all hoped for, um, I decided to, well, at that point, I, I stepped down and kind of looking for my next thing to do. And and Mark, my co-founder, he had acquired Flixel Studios. So the arm of the business that was the production side. And, um, you know, we had some conversation and we said, we got to go back and do a, a, a new thing. He, he had Flixel studios, but then uh, as we discussed it, we said, well, we really want to be everything we learned around building a startup and all of the folks we encountered and everything we learned around marketing. We said, well, we, we really want to be a, a strategy, you know, uh, creative agency. And so uh, there was one particular missing piece for that, uh, which was Jared Folkman, uh, which he became a partner as part of the inception of, of Funday. And so he had, uh, you know, 20 plus six, 25 years of experience in the creative agency world. He was, uh, 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 you know, working with the biggest agencies in, in, in the world, running the biggest accounts uh, and, and brands in the world. And so, he brought in all his expertise in kind of the big agency experience. Uh, but he wanted to do what we wanted to do, which was like boutique vibes, right? Like working not for accountants uh, ultimately, but working for the craft and, and the, the joy of creativity and doing really work that matters and that helps the end client and building a culture that was 
really a differentiator. That's where we saw the biggest opportunity was on the culture side, because, you know, a lot of creative agencies can do great things. There are a lot of similarities. There's great people working at different creative agencies. But ultimately, the one you as a client want to work with is someone that, you know, ultimately cares about your business and that the people working on the account care about your business and will bring their best creativity. And so, you know, as you're seeing right now, you know, Fund it is your strategic and creative partner. So we wanted to bring that energy um, to our clients. And so Jared was, you know, perfect to, to bring in and he's our chief creative officer and he runs really the the day-to-day team, the, create, the creative or anything touching the creative. And he's brought in some of the best from, you know, all the years of experience. He's worked with all the, the greatest talent um, and they, they've come for the culture. Uh, and then our, our fourth partner, uh, Alex Bajian, uh, he um, came from the AI world and, um, you know, being part of the founding team for the financial services for, for AI Watson and uh, really understood the, the fintech space really well, AI, Web3, uh, you know, crypto. Um, and so with the four of us, we were able to um, to just, there was a good good mix of, of uh, talent and ambition and wanting to do things differently. And um, that was really the, the birth of uh, Fun Day. There's, there's two things I want to unpack there for a second, Phil, which is, um, you know, you say we brought Jared in, he was the missing piece. Right. But it's not always easy to attract top talent. Like it sounds like this person, mm. they could probably do whatever they want. I mean, yeah. they're working with big brands. Like, why? How did you attract Jared into the company? Yeah. Well, without going into too many details, uh it it, you know, one of the things we as entrepreneurs that that you do is you you try to de-risk people as much as possible. You try to make it attractive. You um, you really want to set the, the the tone. So, you know, we did we did secure certain um, clients that were going to be able to kick things off. That always helps. Um, you know, there was some hustle that that came before that uh, we were able to 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 leverage. Um, but ultimately he was also helping, uh, you know, there was many other things that he, he helped us along. So there was, you had a relationship, it, it, it was were, a relationship you had a working, that was you had a working yeah, relationship for over, you know, many years. Yeah. So there was, um, you don't just, you, you drop these like seeds yeah, along yeah. the way, like exactly. maybe you should work There's, with us, you know, right. or you, you can't just attract, yeah. uh, without either building a long-term relationship over the years or having something substantial to uh to bring to the table so to for them so yeah you have to you have to look at your um what are you what are you offering and um and make it attractive and i mean one of the things for him that attracted him primarily was you know he could run his own his own ship uh, in the sense that, you know, he had learned all these things and there's a lot of times, and this is a frustration we see in the advertising agency. And this is actually, a, a, you know, one of the things that is problematic in the creative agency world is, um, people work very, very long hours, very little respect, uh, and, and it's, it's a grind and ultimately goes to, you know, bean counters so to speak at the top because most of the big agencies are owned by by holding companies and they just care about the bottom line not the work that's not their primary thing it's like oh if the work gets you the money that's that's fine but it's the bottom line so a lot of decision making is made based on that and so you don't get the chance to nurture the same way your team you don't get to reinvest sometimes the way you would if you were independent and playing the long game. And one of the challenges of a lot of the independent companies is they don't have enough revenue to be able to make those investments into the team. And so, you know, we brought a lot of our innovation from our 
backgrounds in technology uh, to cut costs that we saw as kind of fat in the system. For example, we are fully remote. You don't, when you hire us, you're not paying for us to have a, a big office space that ultimately does not matter for your end result as a client because we've hired folks who love working remote. You know, we were born during the pandemic, so we were remote from day one. That's a huge competitive advantage because our processes are much leaner. We've, you know, you cut costs there that goes into cost savings for your clients, um, which again, that allows for more profit as well and to reinvest uh, in, in, your, in your company. Uh, we've built our own software for time tracking as another example to make it easier and more fun. We call it fun times. Um, and so, you know, those are just some of the examples I can, I can give, but there's many others that allows us to be just much more efficient. And those, at the end of the day, we're doing all of these things because there's always fun to be had. And we want to get to that fun for our clients for our team um in everything we do and so um you know if if i if i may you know going a little bit further here one thing i always liked about uh, a quote that always stuck with me was jeff bezos um, he said you know your margin is my opportunity he was talking about the retailers uh that had you know fat margins and he he kind of played a different game because he was e-commerce and it allowed him to do that and he could scale and he could you know, play the long game in the public markets that they couldn't play because he had scalability and then build all those other services around it. And obviously worked out really well for him. Um, in our case, our philosophy is your culture, meaning most of the creative agencies out there, obviously not all, there are some, some that have incredible culture. Your culture is our opportunity. So if we build the best culture possible, we will attract the best creative talent we will have those creative talent do their best work and be happy and you know work really well with our clients our clients are going to have the best work and they're going to have great results and have fun working with us and they're going to you know spend more with us and tell their friends and so forth and it kind of grows the work gets more work and uh ultimately it's that's our kind of view of the marketplace of how we can win and it's really worked well. Um, you know, in, in less than three years, we've grown to to 60 plus employees and uh we've had you know tremendous clients and um really have done it in a way where the culture is is the culture we wanted to build. And it's our North Star is to make every day a fun day. And, you know, that's for our partners, that's for our clients, that's for our, you know, employees. Of course, it's a North Star. You don't always deliver on that. There's some days that aren't fun. Um, but that is the guiding principle. And, you know, when we're off course, what's great about our name is it always is a mirror to us. And it's funny, every time we're not, you know, as winning as other times or things aren't where it's like, it always goes back. Well, what's not fun right now. And it, like, once you figure that piece out and you kind of correct that everything falls into place. So, so that's, that was the general philosophy was that fun and performance are, you know, two sides of the same coin. And so if you, you know, what is fun? Winning is fun. You know, playing your best is fun. Doing great work is fun. Uh, hitting your numbers is fun. Working in a collaborative way is fun, right? Like all of these things boil down to that. And so that was why we called ourselves Fun Day. And, and, and I would even say one more thing around that is to our customers, when they are with a creative agency, the most fun part of their day sh should be with a creative agency. It shouldn't be when they're talking with, you know, legal and, uh, you know, other board issues or, you know, a bunch of different, you know, HR issues that's going on there in their world. It should be the most fun part of their day because you get to play, you get to create storytelling. It's, 
you're making things, you're seeing your brand come to life, you're seeing your, you know, it's, it should be playful. And so that was kind of the, um, the, the, the reason why we call ourselves Fun Day. And it's at the heart of this, this business, which is really around that concept and infusing it that first at the cultural level. So at the employment level, and then it's going to trickle its way all, you know, and, and touch everything, including our uh, clients and, and partners and so forth. But could you talk about, you know, how do you, what are some things that you do to instill culture in a remote environment? What are some of the things that you do as a company to have a good culture, even though you're not in the office? Yeah, it's um, the one thing that plays in our favor is that day one, we were remote. So we didn't go from being in the office to remote, which I think that causes certain other challenges. Um, so it put everyone on the same level playing field. There's no like differentiation within the team. And we are remote all over Canada, US, Europe. So uh, our team is spread out. And one of the key things is it comes down to communication, number one. So the way I, I view culture is, you know, people, process and performance, right? That makes up a big part. And then, of course, purpose. And so on the people side, it's very important that your communication is awesome. And that's, you know, you're primarily communicating for the most part through, uh, in our case, Slack. So the written communication has to be respectful. Um, and then, of course, when you are in video calls and so forth, the same thing. That's at the fundamental, uh, you know, respect, communication, that starts everything. And then hiring people that are, that embody that. So, you know, the no asshole rule, if you will. Um, so that's at the foundation level, because at the end of the day, it's all people that are going to do things, right? Like people can, that's all what a company is, right? It's a group of people. Then the people will determine the processes. So then you got to be very uh, mindful of the processes that you build because that's how you get the work done. So everything from you know the tools that you use to the how complicated things are from a structural perspective. You know you want to reduce that to simplicity. Um, how we organize uh, what we call pods. So how we service our clients. We design pods so they work very closely together, and that kind of creates a, a, a good working relationship that they can, you know, uh, service you know one or two clients within that pod. And really, always looking at improving the processes, and then injecting fun in those processes as well. So you know, we have. Characters that have been designed, that have been created within, you know, our uh, <laughs> our culture where um, we'll go into too many details, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a kind of fun TikTok type character that just lives internally that shows up at different times. And, you know, we play games on Slack channel that, you know, uh, with emojis and, 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 you know, guess the, the movie trivia with emojis, just like playful silly stuff we have weekly meetings where um we have what we call truth and lies which is when a new member of the team gets onboarded they get to kind of talk a little bit about themselves but through a storytelling mechanism that we call truth and lies and you kind of try to guess what's truthful and what's what's a lie and so all these little things all add up right so you you have multiple different things uh but you also have to be, you know, performing as well, right? At the end of the day, you have to grow. So, so it's people, process, performance. In the process, it's a combination of things that are to get the business done for performance. And then there's other elements that's to inject fun and to inject personality and to inject, you know, that the spirit, if you will, and to embody the the fun day ethos and. Um, and then um, we do, you know, our holiday parties and and other things where we meet in person, um, and not, you know, that's kind of big picture. Yeah, I no, I love that. Details, but... Phil, I know we only have a few more minutes, but um, I do want to highlight a little bit more about what you do. You know, we're talking about storytelling, and this is what you help companies do. 
right? And so mm-hmm. we're looking, if you're looking at this, it's funday.agency slash work. You could see 7-Eleven, you can see um, Perfy, you can see Cerebelli. Um, I don't know if my my favorite, I love the Cerebelli one, but um, mm-hmm. uh, Go Toll or Cerebelli, I don't know which one would be better to talk about. Yeah, so, I mean, they're both fun. Um, uh, Go Toll, we just recently won a Clio Award for it. Uh, it's... Um, uh, we actually haven't updated to the Clio award on the website yet. So as, as like anything else, you always have things that you need to update. Um, so this was kind of the older campaign that you're seeing here, but uh, it was basically uh, what we, it's a toll troll that we invented. Um, Lou, the, the toll troll and it's a fun character, very Pixar uh, kind of style, if you will. And um it's essentially uh, him, you know, stopping you and explaining why you, you know, you, you're kind of an idiot. You didn't download Go Toll. You could have skipped the toll, which is basically skipping the toll troll. And um, and it's a fun campaign. It's little 15 second videos for different kind of use cases, showing the reasons to believe into the uh, into the. Um, into the product and so uh, a perfect kind of way to embody again the story around why you use go toll which is you know so you don't have to use the transponders or go through the the toll and so it's like a mobile app that just does it seamlessly if you will so kind of like how uber does it for taxis but here it's for for tolls and it really tells in a fun way you turn something that you know is a very you know it's a utility app if you will but you turn it into a story and you turn it into infusing storytelling elements uh uh so that the ads are punchy and they just delivered like incredible results uh just in terms of you know the the metrics that marketers care about like cac and and so forth so because the better the ads the cheaper your cost of acquisition becomes and um, as we know, the social networks also reward you if your creatives are good by lowering your your CPM as well. So there's a there's a lot of reasons to um, to do great creative. Um, it's not just to win awards. It's not just to do pretty things. It's and it's not just for fun too. It's actually it will drive performance. Um, and so that was one of the campaigns uh, that that was really fun um, and. You know, you're just you mentioned showing me that bill- we have to update the the, the website. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned though billboards helped mm-hmm. with this. Yeah. So this? yeah. So we we also um I guess we were talking about this earlier before we started recording. Um, like all things, I think from this is why you want a strategic <laughs> marketing company on your side, not just someone who's doing pure bottom of the funnel performance or affiliate marketing or some of these different niches those are fine you have a place for that in some cases but the reason why you want a strategic partner is every product every service has different things that will work for them to acquire customers in different ways and you have to you have to put on your thinking hat you have to start looking and some sometimes test and so in this case for example gotol um well, billboards, when people are driving and seeing, even though they won't download the app right there, it's getting them to make the brand association and then realize yeah, the frustration of like, yeah, they got to stop and pay this toll and all the rest where they could have just skipped by using Go Toll. So it brought in the right type of top of the funnel brand awareness. Then we follow up with those stories that we just t- talked about to go into the mid funnel and bottom of the funnel uh so your full funnel is kind of um touched on and then you're acquiring the customer uh much you know at a, at a lower cac and so you really have to think of the customer journey and where is the best places to for the customer to learn about you and it's not you know most people just think like oh it's social media and it's yes that is one part of the marketing mix but depending on what you're selling, there could be some, some gems that you should be testing and, 
every company has these unique places. You know, in some cases it's influencer marketing, in some cases affiliate, in some cases it's, you know, sponsoring a specific type of event because you're B2B. So there's all types of different ways of um, solving the problem. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask uh, one last question. I don't know if we have, if you have a few more minutes, I just want to hear some of your favorite books. Um, but if you have to run, we can, we can stop, um, Phil, but um, do you have to go? Or do no, you I have can a, take a, a few Okay, cool. Yeah. And I just want to show people, this is my favorite on the site, uh, Sarah Belly. Um, mm. I, I just, I don't know why it's my favorite. I just love the way you walk through the journey here of mm. art and science and then the neurosurgeon mom of three. And, and so I encourage people to check this out and other, other work you have on your page. But um, my last question is just some resources, some of your favorite resources. You mentioned the power of story. What are some of your favorite books or resources that you recommend um, other people check out? You know, the things I like to read are not necessarily always on marketing. It's on psychology, but I am also, I think this is touching more on the founder side of things, um, which is the mental game that you need to kind of get really good at uh, if you want to build resiliency and build the belief that you need in order to, you know, build something from nothing and to carry on. And so one of the things I grew up playing tennis, competitive tennis, and one of my favorite books that probably had one of the biggest impacts, uh, not just on my tennis game, but in life in general, um, because it's, it's really a, a spiritual book, if you will, and a psychological book all wrapped into one. Uh, it's called The Inner Game of Tennis. And uh, there's a whole series of them. It started with tennis, then there was inner game of ski, inner game of music, inner game of work, and it kind of became a. Uh, but at the core, it was about quieting the ego mind, if you will, the self-critical mind, to let your natural self uh, play the sport. And, you know, the, 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 the very interesting is like, there's two selves in you, right? And that's why you're talking to yourself. Well, who's talking to who? And kind of that was the, the general premise. Very much, you know, influenced by the Eastern uh, philosophy, uh, you know, of uh, uh, approach. Um, but very fascinating way through the game of tennis to explain how to become more uh, essentially intuitive and being less um, by not getting yourself in the way, essentially by not having your ego get in the way and, or your self-critical element, right. Uh, get in the way. And so there's some great tactics on it. There's great storytelling in it as well. Um, and Obviously, it's more fun if you play tennis because a lot of the analogies and, and the stories around tennis. But um, there are, like I said, a series. So you can always use if you're into skiing, you can read the inner game of skiing and, and so forth. But I know that books had tremendous impact on many, many people uh, in the business world. I know Bill Gates is one of his favorite books as well. Um, I I urge everyone to check out one of the inner game of uh, tennis is my favorite out of the ones that I've read. Cool. I love it. Uh, everyone check it out. Check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out funday.agency. And Phil, I'm going to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, your journey, and the lessons. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. Seems like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.